Welcome to episode two of the Ready Brew. Um, today we're going to be discussing um, why do we pray in the name of Jesus? Um, what's the big deal? And should we be pay- praying in the name of Jesus Christ? Or should we be praying in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach? It's the Ready Brew Podcast. Let's get into it. Okay, um, when it comes to how we understand things uh, from either a church perspective or um, a perspective of someone who um, is accustomed to reading and studying scripture, uh, for most of us, our perspectives originated from the Roman Catholic indoctrination. Now, um, when we here, uh, many of today's um, politics and political standpoints um, talk about um, conservatism versus liberalism. Um, really, all they're saying is uh, Roman Catholic ideology versus New Age thinking. I mean, see, when this nation first began, um, this this uh, ideology is really what led the way. Um, it's what's the it's what dominated the thoughts of all the people who participated. Um, uh, it was what uh, played the biggest part in the conversion of different people groups. Um, the same ideology is really what uh, rules the land today, but uh, we've learned to fight over the differences in denomination, um, and um, doctrines um, and word phrases and things of that nature. Uh, and, and I don't want to get too deep into that um, because we'll be here all night um, trying to um, go through that with a fine tooth comb. And, and maybe that's something that we might get into on a, 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 at another time. Um, but I, I, I really want to get into identity. Uh, when it comes to our position, or our identity, what is the importance of praying in the name of Jesus? Um, Should we be praying in the name of Jesus Christ? Um, Should we be um, praying in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach? Um, Really, um, what's the big deal? Uh, I want to try to start from the beginning and, and see Um, why first it's necessary that we pray in the, in the name of Jesus. And and I believe that, uh, that reasoning stems from our initial separation from God through Adam. Um, when, when, when God separated man from the garden in essence man lost his connection with god because that direct connection was no longer there so man had to um, go into other things but but let's let's first go to um the book of genesis on um, chapter three um, let's let's go first to uh, understanding when and where the separation happened Genesis 3, um, and we're going to start with verse 22. Well, let's let's start at verse 21. And unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. 
And now let's put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the, of the tree of life. So here uh, we see where that uh, original separation uh, came from. Uh, it was at this point when the man and the woman learned the things of God which were the knowledge of good and evil uh, because man had knowledge. Um, in fact, the scriptures tell us that man named all the animals. Man even named the woman. Um, man had plenty of knowledge. It was just the knowledge of good and evil, the knowledge to distinguish between the two um, that God didn't want man to now partake of the tree of life and live forever, because that would, um, and, I'm, and I'm, and I don't, I don't want to get into um, all of the assumptions um, or, or creating any type of uh, new arguing points. Um, I, I'll just say, at this point, God realized that He had to separate man from the garden, ultimately separating man from God's um, direct relationship. Now, God was still there, but there was a, a separation. Um, and, and what came along with that separation was sin. Um, sin is an effect of the separation. Um, if we go to Genesis chapter four um, and verse number six, um, and then the storyline is um, Cain and Abel have been arguing because of the, the sacrifice. And Cain is upset with Abel uh, because God blessed him uh, because his sacrifice was better. Um, he worshiped best. And so Cain, being um, angry, had a visit from the Lord. And the Lord said unto Cain, this is verse number six. Why art thou wrong? And why is thou countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Now, um, this is the, uh, the point at which um, sin is first mentioned in scripture. And God is telling um, Cain that, that, that um, there's no need for him to lend his power to sin because all he has to do is do well. Um, but we know the story, we know how it ends. Cain kills Abel, um, he and God um, have their words and um, they part ways. Um, so Cain is driven even further away from the presence of God. Um, and now, although um, the, the, the scriptures tell us of this physical separation from the land of his forefathers, um, essentially, um, the implication is also that because um, Cain is now in his sin, he's driven himself away from God because he thinks that God uh, is no longer present there with him. Um, so this is where power, our power in particular, comes into play. Uh, we lend our power to so many things. Uh, and, it, and it's real easy to lend our power to the wrong things. Um, the wrong things being violence, um, being sexual sins, being idolatry, um, being all of those things that go against the nature of God. Um, it requires very little effort um, because all of these things, all of these things belong to the separation. Uh, 
Um, and, and when we separate ourselves from God for just a moment, um, even if, it, if it's just a couple minutes, just to express our anger, um, to um, cuss somebody out, uh, to get into a fight, whatever. In just that moment, uh, we create a separation from God, um, in essence, because we are stepping away from the things of God, uh, which are to do no violence, um, to not uh, commit these sexual sins, um, or not to worship idols. Um, and in just that moment, even if it's even if it's just a split second, we separate ourselves from God for that thing. Um, and, and just like um, Abel. Um, we, we tend to find ourselves in a position um, where now we, be, we begin blaming, blaming God for the things that happen to us. And I hear a lot of people say things like, uh, why, why do I need to be saved? Um, what did I do to God that requires God to have to save me? I didn't do anything wrong. I was born and these things happened. So um, I ain't killed nobody. I ain't stole from nobody. Um, I haven't been uh, mean to anybody or whatever. So why do I need to be saved? Um, and these are the questions they have. And these are the questions that they use to base their faith off of. Uh, and, and the truth is, it's not the actions of the person that makes them sinful. The truth is that it's the separation of people from God that creates the perfect opportunity for sinful behavior. Um, it's, it's, it's similar to light versus dark. As long as we have light, we can see all the obstacles in our way. Um, it doesn't matter how cluttered, Let's, let's let's talk about let's let's um, imagine being in our house, um, in our storage room, where or, or our closet or or the garage or whatever, and we're barefoot. As long as the lights are on, it doesn't matter what's on the floor. If we're looking, we can step over when we need to step over. We can step to the side when we need to step to the side. We can climb over if there um, needs to be us climbing over. Um, so on and so forth and we we manage to make our way through um, the obstacles but if it's dark if it's if it's dark in that in that place then um, no matter how uh, familiar we are with the territory there's always the opportunity for us to either stump our toe to bang our knee against something to knock something down off of a shelf or um, what have you uh, because in the dark when you can't see when you're separated from the light there there comes opportunities for us to mismanage or make mistakes and do things that we wouldn't normally do I mean it's, it's, it's similar to um, tired versus being rested if we if we get enough sleep at night um, then we, we we tend to not have to worry about making the, the minor mistakes on our job. So think about the, the, the time you um, may have stayed up a little too late uh, and you went to work the next day and you're uh, filling out forms uh, and you're 10 records in before you realize, man, I've been putting the wrong timestamp or the wrong date or what have you. And now you gotta go back and correct those mistakes. Um, they, they, they're correctable but you've lost time because now you've got to backtrack and do things that uh, you wouldn't have had to do if you might have just gotten a little bit more rest the night before. Um, an another instance, another instance. Uh, what about dehydration? What about when we find ourselves um, in a position where we haven't been drinking enough water and we've, we've not... Um, got the proper balance of electrolytes in our system. Um, in those situations, our bodies began to do things that are out of sorts. Uh, we might be a little more tired than we normally would be. Um, we might have more brain fog. 
uh, we might have a situation where we could uh, lose consciousness. Um, again, these things can be corrected um, if caught in time and we can rehydrate ourselves and not have these problems. But it, what I'm saying is these are similar to how the this, this situation of separation happens when it comes to sin and who we are as the people of God. Um, now, again, as I said before, this is this is the power play. Um, this is how um, power enters in and how how loaning our power to certain things puts us in sort of a chasm, if you will. Um, when we uh, when we separate ourselves from God, we end up just like Cain. Um, if we if we go back to Genesis four. Um, and let's see. We're going to let's go five through seven. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. So that was verse number five. It was because of Cain's offering that there was no respect given. It wasn't that God didn't love Cain. It wasn't that God wasn't there for Cain. It was just that the offering that he brought was not pleasing to God. Um, the story goes that um, he didn't give the best of his flock. Um, he, he gave um, essentially the worst, the lame, the, uh, the famished, uh, the runt of the pack or the flock. And these things didn't please God. Um, so God let him know that he wasn't pleased, but because Abel got the blessing, then Cain was angry. So again, with the, with the story, we we mimic Cain in many of in the, the ways that we respond when God lets us know that he's not pleased. Because um, while God was trying to explain to Cain that he was the cause of the earth not yielding crops. Cain was busy blaming God. And yet still God tried to give him peace. Um, he said, um, if anybody kill Cain, then I'll take vengeance for Cain. So it's in these moments that we have to be like Cain. Uh, I'm sorry, it's in these moments that we have to try our best not to be like Cain. Because Cain essentially separated himself from God. Um, and that allowed sin to own his power. So again, Cain gave his power over to sin when he was supposed to have the rule over sin. And because alone with God creating us in his likeness, um, there comes an opportunity to voluntarily give our power um, to sin as well. Um, we can give our power to whatever we will. And we see it throughout history. Um, America alone, uh, we see that when someone lends their power to a thing, they become successful in that thing. No matter how short-lived that success, um, America we know has been very successful and it all started from the enslavement of our people. Um, the Europeans came to Africa, um, they stole our resources, those resources being things like cotton, rice, tobacco, sugar cane, the coca plant, um, the rubber trees, um, gold, ivory, um, you name it and it goes on and on and on. Um, they stole our people and essentially they destroyed our economy. Then they scattered us throughout many of the lands um, over, uh, over the world with the help of the Arabians. So um, over time, um, some of them have repented. Some of them um, did feel, I guess, sorry for the things that had happened. Um, and uh, 
they ended the trade of our people, but they didn't end the, ensla the enslavement of our people. Um, and still yet, uh, we've not been compensated for the things, but um, the point that I'm making is that they had the option to volunteer their power to such a thing. And, and that nation will have to answer for that donation of power. Um, we've, we've seen in America how crime families murder and extort in the name of success and that's their free will and they've been successful but they're going to have to answer for those crimes uh, we've seen husbands kill wives we've seen wives kill husbands we've seen mothers kill children we've seen children slaughter parents so on and so forth and in each situation it's their free will on display but they have to answer for their voluntarily giving up their power to these situations and in the end when we do give our power away like this it creates a void uh, regardless of whether or not um, we get comfortable in that void that void still exists uh, many of us today are walking around in a void trying to convince others that we have it all together uh, when in reality um, we have that thing that tugs at our inner selves because guess what it's experienced our power and we've experienced what it's like to surrender our power over and that's why you have a lot of people who can't get over um, the sexual sins um, you have uh, a lot of people who are married um, or given to another person and yet the thrill of having an extra amount of affair drives them outside of their bedroom and it's something that they they've become intoxicated with because they've they've loaned out their power to this thing um, and this thing even happened to our forefathers when we go back to the scriptures uh, we see that Abraham gave over his power um, he gave his power though to the most high rather than the idols and the heavenly body in the process he received the things of the most high it doesn't mean that he didn't see discouragement but even in his discouragement he came out better than he was when he went in uh, when he when he thought that the king would kill him for his wife he lied out of fear but was still blessed because god was present you see there was a separation because he lied there was a void because he felt bad about lying he, he disconnected himself from god but then he reconnected himself with God uh, when he uh, had to stand before the king and he was blessed in that in that opportunity. Um, even when he had a child of his own, um, when he was given Hagar, um, because he distrusted God, his whole house suffered. His wife suffered, the handmaid Hagar suffered, and the child suffered. Um, and I know that you know that story. Uh, but yet they prospered because God was present in the end. Isaac had similar trials and lying for fear of death. Jacob hustled his brother out of his birthright and the blessing. Um, he tried um, it, he tried to kill himself and bribe his brother. He had sons that were deceitful and murderous. And in the end, he was given his own land and wealth during the time of a famine because God was present. So ultimately, the thing that puts us in this situation was the power that we still currently operate in. That power is fueled by a spirit of pride and insolence. Um, it does not matter if we're in the pulpit. It doesn't matter if we're in the pews. It doesn't matter if we're in the streets or the slums. Our pride is where we marry our power, where the pride is supposed to be used to spur us as a conglomerate. We allow the pride to be what keeps us separated because many of us, we see the success as a mountaintop from which we are to yell to others to get their lives on the level that ours are. And this, this shouldn't be the case. This should not be the thing that we aspire to. So to summarize, Sin is a product of the separation from God. And that separation is fueled by our pride. 
And because we remain disconnected, we end up living in the sin and becoming comfortable with it. Just think about it. The time you had sex with that person and you felt bad about it, but you continued to go back because you allowed yourself to become accepting of the feeling of guilt and shame. That was that that pride taken over because it owned our power. So much so that if anyone mentioned anything seeming to criticize a situation similar, we became defensive or angry. And we start blaming uh, the other person involved in the relationship. If, if they're the married person, we blame it on their spouse. Well, if their spouse was doing what they're supposed to be doing, then I wouldn't they, I wouldn't be in their, their bedroom. Or if, if you're the one who's in the relationship stepping out, you say, well, if my spouse was doing the thing that they were supposed to do, then I wouldn't have had to go out and get X, Y, Z, when really it doesn't, it doesn't involve the other person. It all comes back to us. What about that lifestyle that you aspire to because of the, the clout and the acceptance? These things are accepted because of the pride that has arisen from the separation. These things come from the pride that has arisen, which was caused by the separation. So in steps the Messiah. And I'm, I'm going a long way around um, because I, I, I want to make sure there, there are no gaps. Um, but the Messiah steps in. Uh, we call him Jesus Christ. Uh, we call him Yeshua Mashiach. Uh, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Um, the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we're healed. Isaiah 53 um, says... Um, that he did not fit the stereotypical uh, idea of what the Messiah was to embody. Um, he was stricken for the transgression of the Hebrew people in order to reconnect mankind to God with access to the tree of life from the Garden of Eden. To do that, he paid the price owed for the curse of his forefathers and ours. But because he was not decked in royalty, of course, we rejected him. Um, and there was, there were so many other messiahs that came before him. I mean, all alone were killed in battle. Um, there have been messiahs after him. He even said that there were people who would rise about him who would claim to be the messiah. Um, but why was he different? Um, and it, I don't think it's enough to just say, well, just because he was different. Uh, because that, that doesn't answer the question. Um, instead, I want to try to analyze it from a standpoint of sin or the separation from God. Um, we've established that the sin is a product of the separation and it's fueled by pride. So the Messiah being prophesied from times of old uh, was someone that many had looked for. Uh, but they looked for for someone who was of an earthly royalty. Um, they knew that he would be charismatic. Um, they knew that he would be one that people would follow. Um, they knew that he would want to liberate um, their people, our people. Um, and they were very similar to us in that um, we look for someone to lead us who is going to have our desires um, and call for a true freedom. Um, just like us, they allow those who talk good, dress well, and give a great fiscal plan to have their way. Um, each time they come out feeling used and taken advantage of, um, and the Jesus was the same way, or so they figured. Um, he came in pride, but it was not the pride of self. Um, what did he proclaim? What, what did Christ come proclaiming? He came proclaiming the kingdom of heaven. He didn't one time say, worship me and watch me deliver you. He said instead, follow me and the father in heaven will deliver you. So he passes the first test of pride. He did not come in his own name. He came in the name of the most high. The second test 
is his uh, tactic of liberation. How did he come to set the people free? Um, first, he came in healing people. And he didn't just heal Hebrew people, he healed Gentiles as well. Um, he hung out with the prostitutes. He hung out with government officials. Uh, he uh, was against the religious authority um, because they had their foots on the necks of the common folks. Um, that sounds very uh, similar to our day and time. Um, he allowed people to be free from sin. Um, he encouraged folks um, to keep it down when he was in town um, because he didn't want the glory of fame. He only wanted to exalt the glory of his father, the almighty God. For me, one of the most beautiful passages uh, is that of the Sabbath day. Um, and that can be found in the book of Mark, uh, the second chapter, verses 27 through 28. And of course you would read, I, I would encourage you to read the whole thing, but uh, in this, this, these two verses, after seeing the disciples plucking grains on the Sabbath day, um, some representatives from the religious body, um, they asked um, why the disciples were so keen to break the law of the Sabbath. Um, and Christ's answer was still liberation. Just like most of them, we've missed it because of what we've been taught. But Christ says the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Because our forefathers operated in this space of separation fueled by pride, they, as well as the church body believers today, believed that the Sabbath was a way to make men work to please God. And the reality is that the Sabbath was a day of gratitude. Not man's gratitude to God, but God's gratitude toward men. Again, this was the ultimate liberation. Christ was essentially saying the Sabbath was created because God wanted to honor man with the day of rest. And even in giving the law in the wilderness, God still made the Sabbath day a day of honor, a day for man to be honored. Because if we go back, God made the Sabbath day holy at the beginning when he created the heavens and the earth. But we want to make the Sabbath a part of um, quote unquote religious doctrine um, or a part of the quote unquote Ten Commandments and yes he is mentioned in Ten Commandments but it was given long before the Ten Commandments but again uh, this was an example of Christ trying to prepare the people to live in the freedom of the kingdom of God I'm doing the things of God out of gratitude and not out of trying to earn justification so verse 28 was a double blessing in a way the Sabbath already belonged to man as a day of honor. And because man was to believe in Christ who fulfilled the law, that day of honor is a double portion of honor, making liberation of God through Christ even more freeing. So we're even more free when it comes to the Sabbath through Christ. Meaning we can rest even more now in the Sabbath, knowing that God is honoring us. Not only did he honor us with a day of rest, but he honored us by giving us his son who fulfilled the law, who also uh, ordained that day of rest. So it's a double blessing. But thirdly, um, we have to see what Christ's mode of identifying the body was. The Messiah prophecy was one that had the kingdom of the Hebrews operating in one accord. Um, as attested to earlier, every Messiah, past and present, came with promises of unseating the political body. He was to gain their trust and become more than the prefect that spoke on their behalf. A prefect being one that forced Rome to give up their power and leave their lands. This is to be fulfilled in the end, but in the meantime, the opportunity has been extended for everybody who will accept the offer of citizenship within the kingdom of God. 
This essentially is salvation. Christ is giving all who will accept the opportunity to escape the wrath of the Most High, which is sure to come. He will also be the executioner when that time of the Gentile has come to an end. So he is worthy of praise as one who fights for us, but even he understands and understood that the praise doesn't belong to him solely. He understands that the praise belongs to the most high God in heaven. And when you go through Matthew's cha Matthew chapters five through chapter seven, um, there are a series of teachings. Um, the kingdom of heaven and politics, the sacredness of the commandments, almsgiving, sexual morality, truthfulness, and love, all in the effort to make them see and make us see that it isn't about pleasing the Father to gain salvation, but being an example of how pleasing the Most High is in efforts to invite others into salvation. This is the effort of inviting others to that pleasantness. It's not for bickering. Um, it's not for arguing about how this is to be done or how that is to be done. He knew that in order for people to be free, he first had to endure becoming the pledge to break the curse. Now, he was indeed a man. And we learn this from the anguish he felt in the account of the Garden of Gethsemane. So mentally distraught that he sweat blood. In this, in this account given, he had to pray incredibly hard to overcome his humanity. That was something that no man has yet to do since him. Um, there are stories that say that Gandhi was a racist, so he wasn't perfect. Martin Luther King Jr., they say, was a womanizer, so he wasn't perfect. Um, our leaders today go into every agreement based on how they are benefited. Even President Obama passed abortion legislation because he couldn't fathom the idea of his daughter having to be a mother before she was ready. Although she was having sex, which was the thing that ushers in maternity. Yet we discredit the Bible account of how disturbing of mind dying for the sake of humanity had to be to one who knew and experienced humanity from a position of having an original existence that was outside of humanity. He needed so much prayer that when the disciples asked him to teach them how to pray, he said, pray in this way. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's uh, from the book of uh, Matthew, uh, verse nine, I'm sorry, chapter 6, verse 9 to 13. And also in Luke, um, chapter 11, verses 2 to 4. You see, um, Christ understood that um, they needed to help him pray because the anguish was beginning to build. That was the same reason he wanted them awake in the garden because as a human, he wanted to know that he wasn't alone in prayer. And I understand that this isn't what's commonly taught by the Roman doctrine, but this is Bible. While he was having a very human experience, he was still yet God in body. I mean, and his deity comes in his relationship to the Supreme Being, the begotten of God. The best way that I can try to explain the, the, the um, God nature um, is by taking it to a very um, carnal place, I'll say. So just for a moment, if you can close your eyes, um, I want you to sit or stand with your eyes closed. Now, I want you to feel your feet. I want you to feel your the soles of your feet on the floor or in your shoes. And now wiggle your toes. Feel the sensation rise through your ankles as you roll your ankles. And feel the muscles in the front and the back of your legs engage. Now, 
Um, allow that feeling to rise through your thighs and your hamstrings, um, up to your glutes, through your hips, um, up to your abdomen, to your chest, um, down your shoulders in the front, to your biceps and forearms, to your wrists. Um, wiggle your fingers and allow the sensation to come back up through the back of your arm and shoulders, to your neck, out through your head and face. Now, think about this. The muscles need the nerves in order to feel the signals. The nerves, in turn, along with the muscles, need the bones to guide their structure up through the spine, which stems from the brain. So the spine itself stems from the brain, which is a mass that is protected by the skull. So any damage at all to the brain or the spine renders the body powerless. If we go a little bit deeper and examine a little further, we can say that the body itself is the beauty of the female gamete, which is the egg, when it has a perfect union with the sperm cell or the male gamete, which, which has a, a eerie similarity to the brain and the spine. Now, again, that's the long way around because I'm trying to build a picture here. Uh, but it's the perfect exchange of power. And when we look at Christ and who he is and his deity, Christ was the union of a female gamete with the essence of God. God didn't need a sperm cell to create Christ. It was his essence, which was enough to bring out the beauty of the female gamete. See, God is the perfect gentleman. He first made his intentions known, and once it was agreed upon by Mary, then he simply allowed his essence to stir the activation of life in her womb. I mean, this is exemplified by Christ when he acted in that same manner, bringing wine out of water. Christ used God's essence, his God essence, to stir the water molecules to bring wine from water. So Christ was God because he was the ultimate exhibition of God's omnipotence. And being made from the essence, it made him the essence incarnate. This is why in operating in the office of healing, when operating in the office of forgiveness, when operating in, in the office of casting out unclean spirits, there was an excellence about Christ. There was a, a, a confidence. It was exuded from him in the way he walked, in the way he talked. Um, it's recorded in the Bible where they would say he is one who speaks from a place of authority he had an excellence about him but when it came to the office of dying it wasn't in his makeup because his God essence was eternal it was something that he was unfamiliar with it was something that made him very uncomfortable so um he was necessary in form because it would take the, 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 the blood of an eternal essence to undo the curse of the law. This is why he says that he is the body of the book. He is the essence of God, the essence of the book. Even the sacrificing of the animal to cover Adam and Eve's nakedness speaks of how temporal the blood of an earthly finite sacrifice is. As the skins lasted a little longer than the leaves, uh, they, initially, they initially would have to be replaced. So this, uh, this brings me to my main point. This brings us to um, the main topic of discussion. Why did Christ say, anything you ask in my name shall be given by the Father? 
You know, as it as it's been discussed at length by denominations, um, by affiliations, by people who don't believe at all, um, his name was not Jesus Christ. Uh, many of the Hebrew community uh, and others they 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 declare despairingly that because the letter J didn't exist, his name can't have been Jesus. And it has to have been Yeshua. But I am saying on today, and these are my words, that this is not his name either. Yeshua HaMashiach is not his name either. You see, Rome did a thing. They hijacked the storyline. There was no J, but the name that we equate to Jesus was not a name at all. Now, I know that some of y'all really uh, want to disconnect me right now, but just follow along with me. Just, just stick it out with me. Because the name Jesus is actually a title. As discussed earlier, the knowledge of a coming Messiah was prophecy. This was something that had been prophesied for a long time. The Messiah would be the savior of the Hebrew people and ultimately the world. So when Rome did their reworking, the title became the name. Jesus simply is a title that means savior and Christ means Messiah. Um, some authors from the uh, 17th, actually a little bit earlier than that, the uh 15th century and so and, and further back they say that um, it was because Titus and Vespasian were the father and son who ruled Rome during the seizure of Jerusalem that the title Jesus Christ or Savior Messiah was added so that they could teach that Vespasian was God being the emperor and Titus was the son who would save the world Yeshua means savior. Hamashiach means Messiah. So Jesus Christ and Yeshua Hamashiach are synonymous. They mean the same thing. In fact, Isaiah 714 said his name would be Emmanuel, which means God with us. The truth is his earthly name is not what's the most important. He said, ask in my name. And that's where the secret is held. This is where we've got to kind of unlock things. The word name essentially means authority. So Christ is saying, ask in my authority. The reason that we've been successful all of this time, and, and, and to be quite honest, we will probably never get away from saying in the name of Jesus because it's so ingrained in us. But the reason that, it, that we've been so successful in it is because when we say it, we are essentially operating in that authority. Um, so what am I saying? Well, well, basically what I'm saying is don't get bent out of shape if you hear people saying Jesus Christ or Yeshua HaMashiach because it's praying in the authority that is where the power is. That's really the substance of everything and what everything hangs on. And the only way that you can operate in that authority is by re becoming reestablished in that authority. You cannot operate under the law to get the authority. I'm going to say that again for the people in the back. You cannot operate under the law to get that authority. You have to get that authority first before you can even perform the law. But even then, you're not performing the law into salvation. You're, you're, you would be performing the law at that point for the glorifying of the Most High to the world. So I'm going I'm to I'm say that one more time. 
you cannot operate under the law without the the authority. And even when you begin operating in the law because you have the authority, you're not operating to salvation. At that point, you're doing the law to glorify God in heaven for the world to see. And this authority comes by operating in that same faculty of Christ or of Yeshua HaMashiach. Doing that is not arguing about uh, what his name is. It's not about wearing fringes. It's not about keeping dietary laws. It's not even about keeping the law in general. It comes from position and it's how you position yourself. That position is, it is gained by believing in Christ. Romans 10, 9 or John um, 20, verse 31. Um, I'm I'm a, I'm gonna go there. I'm gonna go read. I'm gonna read Romans ten nine. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved, or thou shalt have salvation. Thou shalt have Yeshua. John 20, 31. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. So going through those things that we just discussed, let's let's read it um, a little different. But these are written that ye might believe that the Savior is the Messiah the son of God and that believing you might have life through his authority. Does it, does it, does it feel a little bit different reading it that way? See the word believing is the Greek word. Um, and I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to pronounce it correctly. It's peace. You owe. Peace you own. Um, and it has its foundation in being persuaded of a thing or having confidence in a thing. And, and our confidence um, should be in Christ's completion of the fulfillment of the law. He received everything that the separation offers on our behalf. Christ received everything that the separation offers on our behalf. He was forsaken by the most high. He was falsely accused and he was murdered. And when we believe that he has done what was required for our salvation and the salvation of his kinmen, then we begin to embody that. We begin to embody who he was, who he is. We realize that we are reconnected to the Almighty because he was the sacrifice that the animal in the garden was not able to produce. Instead of a physical covering, we regain the spiritual covering. So where, where Adam and Eve realized they were naked because they lost the covering of God, which was his glory, we now regain that covering through the sacrifice of Christ, which is God's glory. We also receive the breath of God. We receive the breath of God. Because in the beginning, God breathed his breath, his ruach into man. But then he says, for my spirit would not dwell with man because of of." of the evilness of heart. But with the sacrifice of Christ, now we receive the breath of God. We regain God's Holy Spirit. His holy breath is now in us. And his spirit guides us. His spirit not only guides us, 
but he chastises us. He reaffirms that Christ is our sacrifice. He also ushers in holiness. He leads us away from the things that exist in the separation. It doesn't mean that we won't sometimes be enticed by the things that we were used to while separated, but in the process of time, we become less and less drawn to those things as we become holy or set apart to the Father. This is all while being reconnected to the Father. This is how we get shalom. This is how we get the health. This is how we get the peace. This is how we get the wealth. So in summary, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, Emmanuel Ben Yehudi, the names are not effective on their own. Because if you don't operate in the authority that he brought and left with us when he sacrificed himself, then you will never be able to operate in that authority. This is why Paul was adamant about proclaiming that his, his work was perfect. Because it's, it's one that doesn't have to be repeated. When they sacrificed the bulls and the goats, it was because it was, it was something, it was a glory that expired from year to year. But with the sacrifice of the Messiah, this, this is a sacrifice that will never have to be repeated ever. So I guess what I'm saying ultimately is when we pray in the name of Jesus, when you pray in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, you should be praying in the authority. And I'm going to say this. If, if you don't feel like you have the authority, it's time to reassess the relationship. Because it's, 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 it's no different from, uh, well, it's, it's, it's plenty different, but it's, it's similar to this Roman system, this, this Greek Roman culture. In order to be seen as a governor, one has to be appointed by the leader. If the leadership doesn't appoint the governor or doesn't or doesn't approve of the governor, then his word has no sway when it comes to doing things in that manner. Let me let me make it a little more simple. As children, we had um, we had name takers. I'm, I'm speaking about my generation. We had people who, when the teacher left the class, she would or he would assign someone to take names at the chalkboard of the people who talked in class. Now, if we heard the teacher appoint this person, we would do everything in our power to make sure that we didn't get on their bad side. On the other end of that, if the teacher left the classroom and someone became zealous and they just wanted to take names so they could um, let the teacher know, man, those people were rid ridiculed by the entire class because we wasn't about to let that fly. They didn't, you didn't get appointed to that position. That was something you just wanted to do. That was a way that you wanted to look good for everybody else or to the leadership. It wasn't an appointment. So uh, it, and it's similar to that type of relationship. If you don't feel like you have the authority that comes with the sacrifice of Christ, then you need to re-examine the relationship. I'm not, I'm not saying that anybody's condemned to hell. I'm saying you need to 
get that relationship to a place where you know without the shadow of a doubt that that authority belongs to you. This is what it means to be holy. Because the more we separate ourselves from the things of the world, and the, the closer we begin to uh, get to God in our relationship, the, the more connected we become to the Most High, the more empowering this thing becomes, the more holy we become. Ultimately, the more authority we're given. Ultimately, the more authority we operate in. And I hope I hope this helped. I, I hope um, this explanation of why it's important to pray in the name of Jesus, in the name of Yeshua, why it's important to pray in his authority was helpful. So at this point, I'm I'm going to sign off. I'm going to say shalom. I'm going to say good night. Um, and I want to say go in grace. Using every opportunity to reestablish your connection with the Most High. Every opportunity to grow your relationship with the Most High and His Messiah and the Yamashia. Doing everything possible to make sure that you have no doubt about the authority given to you by Christ. Again, um, Shalom. Until the next episode, peace.